Hello everyone. Welcome to the second session um, of the third day during RSNA. Um, I have with me Dr. Walter Wiggins, who's uh, one of our esteemed clinical advisors and also one of the leaders in the space of clinical radiology AI. I would just like to introduce him. Uh, he's a neuroradiologist and is currently practicing with Duke Health. Uh, he also is the clinical director of the Duke Center for Artificial Intelligence and Radiology and has been one of the thought leaders in this space for the past uh, past almost half a decade, I believe, in the space of clinical AI. So thanks, Dr. Walter, for joining us. Uh, it, it's been a real pleasure working with you also and, and taking your guidance over the past some time. Yeah, thanks, Drew, for having me here. So the topic for the session is about uh, clinical implementation of uh, AI in the radiology workflow. And uh, one of the reasons we got Dr. Walter for this session was that he and uh, a bunch of thought leaders in this space have, have, have published a very nice paper on how do you go about and what are the best practices that AI companies should go about implementing AI into the clinical workflows, taking into account all the risks that are associated, what are the engineering challenges that might be there, and how do you balance the retrospective and prospective pieces of deployment when you put it inside a hospital so that the hospital can use it seamlessly as well as be risk-free regarding if anything breaks down at a certain point, how do you do quality control, how do you even measure things like model drift over a period of time. So yeah, Dr. Walter, would you like to take us through on, on what you had talked about in that paper and generally speaking your views on implementing AI in that work? Sure, yeah, so I think when you're, when you're starting Starting out thinking about implementing clinical AI, what you really want to do is, is start by establishing sort of a governance committee. Um, it can be a small committee if you're a small practice, can be a big committee if you're part of a larger institution such as an academic health center. Um, but on that committee you want to have all the key stakeholders from your, your practice or your group that can help you decide about what the right procedures are going to be for selecting and then testing and then implementing a clinical AI solution into your workflows. So this may involve leadership within the organization, this may involve um, IT folks, you need some of your end users, which are typically when you're talking about imaging AI tools are going to be radiologists, but you may also need to include some non-radiologist clinicians who might also be interfacing with the, the tool that you're thinking about implementing. You want folks from IT, you want folks from quality assurance, quality improvement. And so once you get all those people together, you need to have a framework for how you go about assigning key stakeholders for each tool that you're thinking about implementing. So you want um, as you're evaluating different tools and considering which one you want to procure, you want to have uh, a few select people identified as your, your clinical and your IT champions for those type of tools so that they can lead the way in evaluating the different options on the market and trying to decide which one you're going to go with. Since when, once you've selected a tool, the next best step is going to be thinking about how that tool is going to be implemented in the clinical workflow and what testing might be required ahead of time to figure out what's the baseline performance of this tool, what metrics are we trying to improve by using this tool, and how are we going to, going to measure that over time. And so then, um, in some cases, you may do a silent deployment or a shadow deployment where you just put the tool running in the background, but the results never get to the end user, the clinician on the other side of the imaging study, um, and just test to make sure that the system works, first of all, and maybe even gather some prospective baseline performance data looking at your metrics so that you know, once you've gone to the full clinical deployment, whether or not the tool is having the impact that you expect it to have and whether it's performing as expected. So that's kind of the, the general framework for implementation. And how much work you put into um, the testing on the front end is probably going to depend on what the level of perceived risk of implementing that tool is. Yeah, no, the, you have been discussing this framework uh, about seeing on, on, on two axes of what is the amount of perceived risk or amount of influence the AI might have specifically on that imaging modality and on the other side what is the amount of risk in the clinical intervention that might be there. So how do typically then 
those kinds of committees go about balancing that and and we can take specific examples of some of the widely available ai algorithms uh, say cases like intracranial hemorrhage or lung nodule detection which are both different types of cases on the risk scale as well as the ai influence scale so how how should those committees then start looking at what sort of performance parameters they should be setting based on these two axes so the fda uses a classification system called the imdrf risk stratification uh, tool and what that does is it puts puts the tool on two different axes and so on the one axis is how is the tool designed to be implemented is it a, a diagnostic assist tool or a detection tool cad e um, would be the, the usual classification for that under the FDA scheme. Um, or is it more of a fully autonomous tool that does automated reporting or, or some other automated um, clinical decision making? And so the, the more towards automated you get, the higher the risk, perceived risk. And then on the other axis is the clinical scenario that the patient is in when the imaging is obtained. So if you think about an emergency head CT and you're trying to rule in or rule out intracranial hemorrhage, uh, the risk of that situation is, is pretty high because a missed intracranial hemorrhage could be fatal. Yeah. And so, um, whereas something like a uh, screening chest radiograph looking for lung cancer, a missed nodule there is relatively lower on the, the perceived risk. And so, you get into these categories of, of class 1, 2, 3, 4 that we've mapped out in our, in our paper of level of risk. And so the higher the risk, the more due diligence on the front end you're going to have to take. Now, seeing that you lead a lot of trailblazing efforts in this field, and one of the interesting areas that is emerging more and more is as some of the AI algorithms are becoming really sensitive and specific as they get a lot of data, and this is across fields, there are opportunities opening up of efficiency gains that may be there by various automatic classification systems. Now, there's a lot of regulatory roadmap work that still needs to be done. But in terms of just clinical evidence generation and workflow improvement generation, if you take a hypothetical example of an automated prelim reporting system for a chest X-ray, let's say, how would different types of clinical practices, say, uh, academic center like yours or a private practice, would go about even evaluating and understanding that and then what would be the kind of improvements they would set up a, a typical shadow deployment for in your estimate? Yeah, so I think um, starting with the first part of that question, how would different practices handle a, a system like this? If we're thinking about uh, auto reporting of, of normal chest radiographs or prelim reporting of normal chest radiographs, in an academic center, you might consider doing what uh, Dr. Contractor was talking about earlier today and potentially having all of the, the presumed normal studies routed to your more junior uh, members of, of your training cohort, so uh, residents earlier on in residency, and then the more challenging cases with the abnormal or presumed abnormal pathology on them diverted to more senior trainees or such as late, later residents or senior residents or fellows um, or routed to directly to the attendings for interpretation and that may uh, ease the burden on the the junior residents of having to deal with a lot of complicated follow-up ICU chest radiographs it may also improve the uh, work environment for the attendings by reducing the volume of the, the normal studies that they have to deal with independently of the ones that they're reading out with their residents and then thinking about how a private practice might do this, I can, I can imagine a couple of different scenarios. One would be where um, you would triage abnormal reports to a specific person who's only designed or whose only job for the day is to read abnormal chest radiographs. And then you could shunt all of the presumed normals to other members of the practice, sort of in the way that some practices do screening mammography, where they just take, you know, assign 25 cases to an individual radiologist who's not a dedicated diagnostic breast imager, um, but just another member of the practice. So shunt those radiographs in the same way so that they know they can just kind of handle those whenever because they're presumed to be lower risk, having already, already been screened as, as normal. And so those are a couple of different ways that you might consider that implementation. And I think from a monitoring standpoint, what you really want to do is start off with either a, a consecutive series of cases that are accumulated, um, 
across your practice in a retrospective fashion and get a sense of what the accuracy of the tool is for, for screening out those normal exams. Um, or go forward with a shadow deployment where, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, tool does, or the results of the tool don't actually get bubbled through to the clinical setting. You're just getting a sense of, in a live prospective manner, how well that tool is performing by comparing the reports of the radiologist to the results of the tool to get a soft marker of concordance between the radiologist and the tool. I was going to segue into quality assurance, but you, I think, already preempted that part because uh, that that has been one of the challenges of, of, of such systems. And uh, are there any examples that come to your mind of such kind of quality assurance systems that have been implemented maybe in other parts of medicine, where you had an almost automated prelim report or an automated classification coming through, and the system then going through various uh, number of reports. I think. Automatic retinopathy comes to my mind, but but is there an example that AI players can learn from on on setting that kind of what kinds of system up there? Yeah, so I think um, diabetic retinopathy is a, a good use case. So the IDX system uh, that has been FDA cleared for autonomous reporting of retinal photography for um, diabetic retinopathy is is a good example of this, where. Um, you know, normal normal studies can essentially be, be shunted out from low resource settings and you don't have to, to worry about those necessarily, but that the patients with abnormal studies will get referred to a, a specialty retina center um, where they're, they have the capability and the expertise to further evaluate those imaging studies, even though they've already been, you know, fully reported by the, um, by the automated system. There's sort of a second reader uh, phenomenon that way, but only for the abnormal ones that get referred out to the, an expert in medical retina disease. And so I think, you know, another consideration for automated reporting of chest radiographs is, is to just let those uh, auto-reported radiographs kind of in certain settings, maybe let them go like they do in the UK where a lot of studies go unreported and let those go and then only focus on the abnormal ones, maybe even routing them to a chest radiologist for a dedicated chest radiologist for further review. I think we are coming to the last part of the discussion then. Uh, there are multiple improvements that various types of practices look for, where some improvements are considered more above the other, say efficiency gains, or you might be actually looking at more patient capture, considering there are a lot more findings that you can extract from the image using AI. Some things, some people are calling opportunistic screening, say. So my question to you would be, for, for these kinds of automated systems, there are two applications where you can reduce the workflow, or you can also look at triaging or capturing some more uh, things that you were not able to look at in the current workflow. So a hospital system efficiently sh should look at what kind of clinical metrics to, to see of what may be of more use to them. Because uh, so what I would like to know from, so let's say your center, um, I don't know about the amount of backlogs and a center of your size may have, but what would be of more interest typically to centers? Would, be, would it be efficiency improvements in terms of turnaround times? Or would it be areas like more capture of patients because then the questions of additional workload also come up and considering we are living in a world of physician burnout, how do you, how does a hospital go about then balancing those concerns too when they are looking at AI? Yeah, so I think if we're looking specifically at chest radiographs, one of the, <clears throat> the biggest problems that we encounter in an academic center like ours where oftentimes uh, some chest radiographs don't go reported for hours and hours at a time is that some clinician has already evaluated the chest radiograph, decided that it doesn't have any acute findings necessarily, but there may be a chronic finding like a lung nodule. And so they may not be able to detect that. And if it goes undetected, they may discharge the patient to home and then establishing follow-up with that patient, recapturing them back into our system for the chest CT that might be needed to uh, further evaluate that lung nodule and look for others, or the lung biopsy that would be needed to, to be able to determine if that lung nodule is malignant or not. Um, there's a lot of effort that then goes into reaching out to that patient, trying to get them rescheduled, get them back to the hospital for that further diagnostic testing. And so I think there's a, a potential efficiency and uh, even money to be saved in 
having rap more rapid turnaround time for some of these reports that often go, uh, or studies that often go unreported for a long period of time. And then, you know, I think Hari Trivedi did a nice job in his editorial, he's from Emory, did a great job in his editorial in the JACR this past year, talking about the differences between big academic centers and what their goals are going to be, or larger health systems and what their goals are going to be versus smaller private practices. And so I think smaller private practices, just handling the volume is really going to be one of their biggest concerns. But at least with chest radiographs, one thing they're really going to be concerned about is decreasing the number of missed lung nodules. And there was an interesting study, this relates more to neuroradiology, but an interesting study recently that looked at uh, the relationship between the volume of studies that you read in a day and the error rate and there was a, a sharp increase in the error rate after a certain number of studies it doesn't really matter what that number is for the purpose of this discussion but the point being that if you can reduce the volume that uh, radiologists out in the community are having to read theoretically you should be able to make an impact on their miss rate as well I think that's a good point to end the session and open it up to the audience Thanks for coming in. Great. For going through that, and I think the audience can ask their questions now. You were talking about constructing normal scans to be your radiologist. How do you build the trust with the AI? Like over time, like what is that? What does that look like for you know, younger rads versus the rads that are like here auto reporting and normal? So how do you build the trust, whether it's the company or the algorithm? Yeah, so I, I think it's very similar to um, working with a, a new modality or working with a new reconstruction algorithm. So if we think about uh, CT or MRI, we're constantly improving the way that we do reconstruction of those images from the source data to generate a diagnostic image. And it really just takes time and retrospective review and making sure that the thing is working as expected in order to develop that trust. So I think when you're when you're talking to your team about how you're going to implement this and about how they're going to develop that trust, having a good QA system in place to go back and review those results and make sure that things are working as you expect them to is going to be one way to sort of reassure them. And then I think painting it in the same light as this is the same thing we did 10 years ago when we implemented iterative reconstruction in CT, or this is the same thing we're doing with our new AI augmented MRI reconstruction that we're testing out. So any new tool that you're gonna test out, there's gonna be um, a period early on where you're just gonna have to, to use it, get familiar with using it, how it works, how it fails, when it fails, and being able to, to go back and review those results to really develop that trust. And it's really just going to take time and, and faith in the system that you put in place for implementation to, to really get a good feel for, for that. Any more questions? One question if I could ask. Sure. Um, which, uh, came from this example. I learn every every time a new thing from you when, when it comes about. So that is a very nice analogy that you just gave of 10 years ago when you started those kinds of systems. Uh, one of the things that uh, a lot of AI companies generally face is in terms of integration, in terms of a thin viewer or integrating into the general workflow. From just an efficiency improvement standpoint, a lot of I think a lot of gains in AI have also come in making the workflow very easy and getting the uh, getting the right information at the right time, uh, even more than the accuracy in some cases. So, from your perspective, coming more from a radiology standpoint, where do you see the field kind of going as AI tools expand across various imaging modalities, and it becomes very it becomes kind of tenuous for the radiologist to open multiple viewers at the same time for every different modality. If they open a different viewer, it just takes away some of their time, which the AI might be saving them. So it's more an exploratory question on on how do you think this whole area is then going to evolve. Yeah, so I think um, one of the big lessons we can take away is from the RSNA Imaging AI and Practice demonstrations that I've also helped develop over the past couple of years. Um, and we published an article in, in Radiology AI a couple of years ago about our initial experience with that in 2020. 
where um, we've really uh, doubled down on this concept of an orchestration platform for trying to get data out of the uh, medical imaging archive to the appropriate algorithm at the appropriate time and then getting those results back integrated into the PAX workflow that radiologists use. Um, Third-party viewers such as mobile apps or even desktop apps can, can certainly serve their purpose outside of the radiologist workflow, but in the radiologist workflow, I think really the, the best thing to do is to try to integrate it as best as possible into the actual PACS reading workflow so that a radiologist isn't having to move outside of their PACS system every time they want to look at something. That said, I think for, for providing early notifications to other members of the clinical care team, our non-radiologist clinicians or technologists or others, I think there's still a, a very important role for things like mobile apps for, for notification and desktop apps may also be useful as well if the clinicians aren't able to view the results in the, in the enterprise imaging viewer in particular. So I think those are some of the, the biggest workflow improvements that you can make. I think that's a good note to end the session. Uh, if there are no more questions, uh, thanks, Dr. Wiggins. All right, it was a pleasure hosting you at our booth. It's always a pleasure listening to you. Thanks for having me here. Yeah.